How is it that like I will put my face into a lion's mouth? Like I've been swimming with anacondas. I've, I've wrestled alligators for NBC. I've done all sorts of crazy stunts, submerged myself in a sinking car in a frozen lake, uh, been to war zones. Like I've done all this stuff that is highly dangerous and I don't have that physical fear. I'm capable of surmounting the physical fear with this courage. But when it comes to something so simple, like performing in front of people or going on camera for my day job at ABC, I emotionally crumble. Hey, Heel Squad fans, welcome to Heel Squad with Maria Menounos. And as you probably can guess, it's not Maria Menounos, it's Mr. Maria Menounos. And today, and today of all days is No Time to Panic. It's actually the uh, title of a book, author Matthew Gutman, uh, where we're going to break down anxiety, panic attacks, uh, something I believe uh, many of us suffer from. Um, and certainly uh, anxiety is just a crippling condition that I see is actually growing. Um, before we get into that, I want to share our quote of the day. Everything you want is on the other side of fear, Jack Canfield. And isn't that true and it really is but by the way how do you break through your fears when you're filled with panic and anxiety so uh our friend matt gutman is going to help with that and might as well get right into it matt is an accomplished journalist and abc news chief national correspondent with an impressive career spanning 24 years he's reported from over 60 countries across six continents gutman's work has been recognized with prestigious awards including Emmys, Murrow, DuPont, Gracie, and NABJ. He's covered major events such, such as the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and high-profile stories like the murder of Trayvon Martin. Additionally, Gutman has written a personal memoir, No Time to Panic, as we said, detailing his battle with panic attacks and his journey to wellness. And when I read a resume like that, Matt, um, and I see where you've gone, I just I wonder if some of the stuff you've covered hasn't created some PTSD, but I know in the book, this was these were conditions that were going on, but I commend you for <laughs> having those experiences with this condition. You know, yeah. Thanks, Kev. Yeah, I got it. Can you go back? What is that, Jack Canfield? Yes. That quote? Everything you want is on the other side of fear. I love that. And, and that's one of the ways that actually that I have conquered panic, uh, if you can use the term conquered. Okay. Um, I, instead of fearing it, I am now embracing it and welcoming the anticipation, the fear of the thing I fear, right? And when you kind of welcome it, and it sounds a little bizarre, but when you kind of welcome it, it defangs it. It takes the scariness out of it, um, which is something that has been very useful to me. Um, but yeah, you know, everybody asks, dude, like, how is it that you cover wars and some of the scariest things that a human can experience? And I've been held captive in Venezuela and, you know, experienced oh. being shot at and explosions and, and war zones in, in many countries. And that doesn't scare you, but going on camera or performing in front of a group that gives you panic attacks. Um, so a short answer to the question is that one of the things that scares me in performance is the expectation of perfection. Oh, when we are expected to be flawless. I, we, I crumble. Um, but in a war zone or in the middle of a storm or whatever kind of chaotic situation you're in, I welcome that because there was no reasonable expectation of perfection or flawless that they're shooting behind you. There, there's chaos. There are tanks moving. There is, you know, a wild animal bearing down on you, a storm beating you up. So like, no, of course you can't be perfect. And then I'm like, oh, I'm in my element. There's no expectation. I feel free yeah. and I can do the You thing. almost can't lose, right? I mean, what could you do wrong? I mean, other than exactly. lose your own life, but wrong in the sense of how anyone else could judge you. <laughs> There's that. That's a good point. Do you think Kev, do you do you also think um and you might not be able to answer this, but do you think the your, your adrenaline in those moments kind of does could that cancel out the panic and the anxiety? So I think there's something to it because I also, you know, I'm, I've been diagnosed with ADHD since I was a little kid. I never took medication. My mom was not into it. Okay. Um, and so I was really bouncy as, as a small person and as an adult, uh, bouncy and um, easily distracted. And, you know, I had some trouble. 
But um, when you're in the midst of chaos and real danger and that knife's edge between life and death, not necessarily that I experienced it all the time, but I'm seeing people on their very worst day of their life. And it's hugely clarifying. Right. And it takes all of that noise away, especially for someone with ADHD and forces them to focus to tunnel vision on one particular thing. Um, and so for me, it's it's sort of a fringe benefit of what I do and, and probably one of the reasons that I do what I do, um, because it just works for me and my particular personality and my weaknesses and, and high anxiety and, you know, lifelong panic attacks is part of that. And when you, ha so when you were having them as a kid and, you know, you look relatively young, but I grew up in a time where people didn't really know, they might've known a little bit about, oh, I'm having a panic attack. It was either cliche. It wasn't taken serious. So tell me about your, I know, tell me about your childhood where you experienced these attacks, but it seemed like you had an awareness that, that I found interesting because we wouldn't have known. We would have gotten, a, I hate to say it, a backhander. <laughs> we would have been put in the corner or maybe, who knows, just sedated. I, I don't know. So take, take me through some of your childhood experiences where you started experiencing yeah, I mean, them. I, I didn't know that I had panic. I didn't even know about anxiety until my 30s, right? Like, yeah. I, I think I'm the same generation as you. I'm, I'm 46. Okay. And I think I had my first panics, mini panics. I was president of the school council and every morning I'd have to deliver this address before the school, you know, like whatever it is like. It's still a big know. deal it, relative yeah. to your age and what you're doing. And so I would get super nervous, but I really only had the first like underwear wedding, you know, earthquake, refrigerator shaking, mind numbing panic attack in college. I was delivering or I was defending for whatever it's worth. My uh, college thesis, I spent like the whole year writing. It was 200 pages, like Turkish-Israeli relations, like super academic. Mm -hmm. And I felt like a failure. And I, I had listened to the other kids in front of me um, do their thesis presentations. And they were like obviously far smarter than I was and far more accomplished and more reasonable. And I realized I hadn't fully prepared or well enough, even though I knew this thing cold. And I got up there. They called my name. I got up there. And I felt like there was a trap door beneath me. I felt like I'd fallen through some sort of a wormhole and I was gripping the podium in this white knuckled grip. And suddenly I, I was like molting into a werewolf. It was this out of body experience and I had no foundation to be able to understand what the heck it was. And so I'm doing my thesis talk, whatever it was, I can't remember a word. All I know is that everybody there must have thought I was a complete idiot and incomprehensible. So I do the thing. I can't see anybody. I start sweating. My vision is going through a pinhole. I am shaking, trembling. I feel like I'm having a heart attack. And finally, somehow I wrap it up. I have no idea how long it was. Like it was a total blackout. I go back into my seat, sort of rubber legged. And I sit down there and I'm like, I hope nobody can see how much I'm sweating through this this turtleneck that I'd wore because I thought it was like, you know, an academic. Yeah, you got to be, of course. Sweater turtleneck. Yeah, and the tweed coat with smart. the patches on the, on the. Exactly. <laughs> like that. Very, and I'm like, oh, it was a bad idea. It feels like claw, cats are clawing my neck. And uh, I sat down and I, I, I just completely did my best to put that in some sort of garbage bin and bury it and never think about it again. It was so horrific. So like, and I was, I was seeing a psychologist at the time. We talked about depression. I had had, my dad was killed in a plane crash when I was 12. And so like, oh, I was boy. aware Hello. of psychology. Wait. Yeah. Okay. And um, obviously all of this is in the book and, you know, yes. it, it talks about my, my journey from uh, like childhood and, and having a couple of traumas and then through college and, and my career. Um, but I knew about psychology and I knew about depression, but I'm your contemporary and you're right. Nobody talked to us about anxiety, certainly yeah, no. not panic attacks. I didn't even have the knowledge of what a panic attack was. It was something silly that happens to old men in movies who think they're having a heart attack. That wasn't me. I was young. I'm vibrant. I, I'm not having a panic attack. I got nerves or something. I don't know. I don't know. Some sort of nerves. I'm not going to think about it until um, I had to think about it. And I had I had a reckoning. And how much do you think the, the traumas of childhood factor in? 
you know, there, there's some signs into this and, and the traumas of childhood could factor into it. And, you know, losing your father in a plane crash is, is a pretty traumatic at thing. At 12. To, or at 12. Um, so I, I don't know. It's also genetic, right? Like oh, it, people okay. are born into families who are highly anxious and, and that's me. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I married a woman who's also highly anxious and my kids are highly anxious. The difference is that we talk about it. Um, they know what anxiety looks like. They know what it feels like. They haven't had a panic attack uh, that I know of, um, but they would be able to diagnose it. And for me, you know, I, I so I went to college and then I decided I wanted to become a conflict reporter. And so I traveled in South America I just, and Africa. I just for find it a year. fascinating. I find it fascinating that you have these panic attacks, but yet you're attracted to the 180 degree, the con the, the exact thing that would create big conflict, and panic. You know, to, so have you explored that? You know, this is what Maria talks about all the time: the polarity, right? Yeah. You know, we can be fierce and we can be soft. We can be you know, people who are prone to anger and also be super gentle. And I'm someone who is, and I call it you, I mean, you hit the nail on the head, Kev. I call it the paradox of the courageous coward. And this is sort of my jumping off point. I'm like, how is it that like, I will put my face into a lion's mouth. Like I've been swimming with anacondas. I've, I've wrestled alligators for NBC. I've done all sorts of crazy stunts, submerged myself in a sinking car in a frozen lake uh been to war zones like i've done all this stuff that is highly dangerous and i don't have that physical fear i'm capable of surmounting the physical fear with this courage but when it comes to something so simple like performing in front of people or going on camera for my day job at abc i emotionally crumble so it's that so, way, it's, i think it's good for people to hear that so it maybe it's just that one thing or that one kind of thing that triggers something else inside of you you know for you it's that and I, I think you're right about the expectation of perfection like we i i think that's it but when you talk about genetics was your i know you didn't know your dad long but was this through your dad or through your mom both like i think it's probably i mean probably through both and so many of us are anxious right all of us have this baseline of anxiety yeah some people have a bit more some have a bit less um i think my dad was not a super anxious person um my mom is is a pretty anxious person. And again, like, you know, I, I found, going back to polarity, I found that the anxiety is sort of my superpower in some ways um, because it allows me to tap into a level of empathy and sympathy, um, to feel, to constantly be thinking, well, what, what are other people thinking right now? What are they feeling? What is that person undergoing right now? And how can I communicate with them? And I think the tragedies in my life are also the superpower. Um, you know, I was held captive by the uh, Venezuelan secret police for five days, which is not that long. It was extremely scary because we thought that they were going to keep us for months, years. It was unclear. They had accused me of being a spy. Oh. And that was really pretty scary and traumatic. But it gives me another tool to be able to empathize with people who are going undergoing something that most of us couldn't fathom that my personal tragedy with my father like most of what i do in my day job kev is meeting people on the worst day of their lives when the crappiest thing has happened and they lost their home they've lost a loved one they've undergone some sort of horrific event and there's this guy descending on them from abc you know like tell me your story and i feel like i can communicate people in our mutual language of grief Right. And, and that's an asset for me. So there is a lot in, in this world of panic and anxiety that is not only something that is a dis is a disadvantage, but that I've learned is not only a feature, but I can use it as a feature, even if I haven't so far. Um, and so, yeah, there's a lot of like sort of emotional jujitsu that is involved in, in reframing anxiety and panic. And also, you know, there are all the other modalities that we're going to get into shortly, I'm sure. But right, so that's like how we're framing it now. Got it. Yeah. We, you're going to give us all the tools, I'm sure. With, with, with So after college, you you have this experience, but I'm assuming like most of us, you just play through 
and you just forge ahead, typical male, like, nope, I got this, no typical. big deal, that was nothing. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, like, I blew you know, my college paper, that's it, you know, right? Right, and I got it, like, it was not even, the thing is, like, I, I, I was performing in front of performing, I was speaking in front of my friends, basically, it was not graded, it was not even mandatory, and yet I have this, like, almost psychedelic panic experience, which was through the roof insanity. Um, anyway, so it's funny, like sometimes the stakes are so low, but in our head, we make it such a big thing. Um, so I became a correspondent. I went to the Middle East during the second intifada, which is the major explosion of violence in the early 2000s. We're now obviously in the midst of the second one. I'm speaking to you from Jerusalem, um, having covered it quite a bit over the past uh, five, I'm, six I'm months. Sorry, side note, I was just blown away by you, but continue. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Uh, it's been it's been very difficult here, very sad. Right. Uh, but eventually I started doing radio and I realized that when I was doing radio, I'd have these mini panic attacks and like words would magically disappear from the page. And then it became even more intense once I started doing TV uh, in the early 2010s. And it was years into that that I was sitting in my friend Dan Harris's office. And he was describing this book he was going to write, this some like 10% happier thing. And I'm like, oh, that's really interesting meditation. You know, I've kind of like my parents took me to transcendental meditation when I was 12 and I kind of did it. And he's talking about his book. I'm like, holy crap. So that's a panic attack? That's a panic ah. I have panic attack. I've, I've been going through this for years, like 15 years by then. And anyway, so Dan actually, <laughs> with all the therapy that I'd been doing, it was Dan Harris in his office who basically is like, Matt, the, those are panic attacks. That That's what you're experiencing. And I, uh, you know, the 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 penny, the dime dropped, or the, and I just finally understood it after so long. Um, Your Oprah aha moment. Yeah, it really was. And it's kind of embarrassing that, you know, that we, as you said, we play through it. Yeah. And yeah, I played through it. I couldn't even diagnose it. And I considered myself pretty aware and, and pretty in tune with myself, but obviously not that in tune. Um, but it really wasn't until January 26, 2020, that I had a reckoning. Like I, I always managed to skate through. It was really uncomfortable. Like I'd sweat through clothes. I would tremble. I would be left with like terrible back pain after a live hit, which is for those who don't know, like in network news, we have a 15, 20, 30 second portion of live uh, to live to the camera uh, in the beginning of a piece. And then at the end of the piece, and it's relatively short. So you're expected to kind of deliver it flawlessly or close enough. Um, and that would cause me this massive explosion of anxiety. Uh, by the way, so like if people don't know what a panic attack is, uh, I describe it as um, like if pleasure, if an orgasm is the maximal expression of pleasure, then a panic attack is the maximal expression of anxiety. So it's sort of the orgasm of anxiety, um, something that leaves you panting, sweating, and not knowing exactly what just happened. Um, it's it's like a big experience if if anyone's gone through it. And and, um, and it can manifest in several different ways. It could be shortness of breath. It could be sweating. It could be passing out. Right. Some people do, or all the above. And you know, once I started the research, I've seen actually book, people even not be able to speak. They haven't had those other things, but. They're, they're, yeah, like me, <laughs> you know, like there would be times where I had a panic attack on air and the first word out of my mouth would be like, egg, <laughs> you know, like I couldn't get the word out because your, your brain. Okay. So what it is, is your brain essentially assessing a threat and your brain is telling you that this threat is so big and so major, you have to stop all these other bodily processes at the same time in order to make this threat assessment. Now, the good news is that it only lasts anywhere from 15 to 90 seconds because it's the period of the assessment of threat. The bad news is it's not great to function when you're trying to go live on TV, right? And so if you have 15 to 20 seconds to talk and you're losing your brain for 15 to 30 seconds, that's not a great thing. Um, it feels to many people like they are dying. Again, uh, trembling, shortness of breath, tightness in the chest, um, tunnel vision, sweating, trembling, feelings of derealization, um, feelings of impending doom, feelings of loss of control. Um, 
It's also the reason that about 40% of all people who check themselves into the ER thinking that they're having a heart attack are actually having a panic attack. And 58%, almost two thirds of everybody who goes to the hospital thinking they're having a heart attack is either having a panic attack or suffering some sort of anxiety that may be in addition to whatever actual cardiac issue is going on that's physical and not just mental. Um, but it is a, a physical manifestation of a mental ailment, essentially. And, you know, I think we have to, in talking about empathy, we've, uh, most of our audience is, is, is female. And I find with men, we'll power through, we'll caffeinate through, we'll do, you know, with women, they won't even get up to bat. And that's what I find so tragic. I, I know a lot of women that won't advance their careers. They won't advance their dreams. They won't stand up for themselves. They won't because they have, they know it's going to lead to the anxiety and the panic. And so they don't even mm -hmm. go through that. And that's why I think the book, once again, No Time to Panic, is just such a great book to have. So let's go to 2020 again, Matt. Will you have your aha moment, if you would? I just want to say oh, please. that, you know, I, I hear you, but I also think there are a lot of men, and I also happen oh, to come from a very strongly matriarchal family where the women are the power. They take on the masculine, so, yeah, and and they yeah, power through. Yeah, they're just like, you know, the women in my family, including my wife, are very, very strong people. And my wife managed to somehow pull herself up from the boot, by her bootstraps after two bouts of postpartum, which could have rendered her completely, you know, just devastating. Yeah, it's horrible. But she pulled herself together twice. Um, and so, yeah, like I, no, I think, I think it the really men go through depends. it. And the thing is, but the men, it still, if the, even though they power through it, I feel like uh, it's, it's a, it's a, sh it's a short term game because long term, I, I'm a believer that this is where heart attacks, cancer, all those other things, if it doesn't get it, it's going to, it's going to get you one way or another. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I, 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 that, that's what I see people who, I feel like our bodies become incubators for illness when you are have okay. anxiety and panic. Maria has a lot of it. I have less, thank goodness. But I will say to Maria, and you know, we talked because we talked this morning about your book, and I and I I said, you know, Maria, like, it goes back to what I've been saying. You can circadian rhythm, red light therapy. You can have a great diet. You can do all those things, um, and it's going to help your life. But if you don't take care of what's going on emotionally, the anxiety, the stress and all that stuff, it's going to get you. It's just going to get you a little slower, but it's going to get you. And, and you know, that's exactly it, Kev. I, I, that was my fear that like eventually, first of all, the fear was that I was going to have some major cataclysmic disaster on air. Right. Second, that keeping all of this in, not telling anyone, basically at first I didn't tell literally anyone. And then I told my shrink and my agent and my wife, um, like nobody knew you in held the it all in a closely kept secret that I had because I was worried I'd be cut loose. Like I'd be dead. Yes. In our that business. That's right. Me. Oh my God. As a reporter. Oh my God. He's, he's on a live feed and a, a regular person's going to think he's a live feed in a war. This guy's going to choke out. That's our business. And then it happened. Oh, exactly. You know, they say, you know, when I tell my kids this, you know, don't worry so much. It's probably not going to happen. Until my one of my worst fears, obviously, that wasn't like part of my something terrible happening or bad health to my family in terms of personal fears, one of my biggest fears actually happened. And it was January 2020, January 26, 2020. I was on my way to report on the Kobe Bryant helicopter crash. And we were on a live special report. And I made, and I want to get into it, but I made a reporting error. Okay. It was a bad, bad mistake. And I was having a panic attack and I was unable. So one of the things, you know, we, I said that your brain basically shuts down and it's unable to process certain things. It's really good. Your brain is really good during a panic attack at having spatial awareness. Basically your eyes, the reason you see tunnel vision is because your eyes, your pupils dilates, so you're taking in more light. Um, so like, you know, impulses, input, you're good at that. But remembering two different sets of facts that came from two different people and knowing which one is reportable and which one is not, your brain is not good at that during a panic attack. And that's what was going on with me. And I made a cataclysmic mistake. And um, we weren't quite sure how wrong it was for about an hour or so. And then, you know, I issued a correction on air live as well. Um, 
and basically it, it was really bad. And, um, I was suspended for a month and obviously, you know, my, my, uh, Kobe, Kobe died in a helicopter crash 10 miles from where I live in Encino, which is not so far from you guys and uh, in Calabasas. And like, it was, he was basically the same age as my dad. And I was the same age as Gianna and all this stuff is going through my head. And I was simply unable to separate one thing that I heard that was reportable that I could go on air with and another thing that wasn't. And I made it this terrible mistake. Um, and I felt for the family and I was thinking, oh my God, if someone actually heard this or if someone told them about this, it'd be terrible. Um, and eventually I was suspended for a month and I had this reckoning. And I, I told my wife, like, I, I don't know if I can keep doing this job. And I know like we need the standard of living and um, you know, I need this paycheck. It's, you know, one income household. Um, but I don't know if I can keep doing it. And she was so supportive. She said, listen, if we need to downsize, we will absolutely do it. You need to do what you need to do. Partner. And I fully support you, you know? Um, Amen. And we decided that I would finally actually take panic and tackle it head on uh, instead of ducking it. And so over the next three years, and this is the process, it wasn't actually a book yet. I didn't know that I was writing a book for another like year and a half afterwards because right now I was trying to figure trying out to heal, two things. Trying to get, yeah, trying to learn how to cope Why am this. I broken? My basic premise is like, okay, something is broken within me. I need to figure out what it is that's broken, why it's broken, and then how to fix it. And so the first question is like, how do I even have this genetic kink? Like, what is this kink in the human genome that it gives people this horrific um, syndrome? It's not a syndrome, but it's, you know, panic attacks mm -hmm. and enables them to suffer through life, fearing the anticipatory anxiety of having a panic attack and then going through this basically cataclysmic feeling event. And if I'm broken, how many other people out there are broken? So actually, like, first I learned what a panic attack was, like the chemical cascade that happens in your brain and affects your body, um, how bad it is for you. And then I wanted to know why it is that we have them at all. Like, why haven't humans adapted out of panic attack if it's so unhealthy, so bad, and so potentially dangerous for us, right? Like, we have opposable thumbs. You know, we don't have tails anymore. We don't have hair all of our all over our body we've adapted to be obviously the most or we think the most intelligent creatures on the planet so like why do we still have this thing and eventually i went into this deep deep dive into evolutionary psychology and eventually i learned that anxiety was the best invention human that's what i was gonna say i think it's from. part of the evolution yeah was it, like, it came in we, but... we learned to be afraid sooner it's like okay, you're you're in a we're an ape started with early primates, but we the the apes fine tuned it and the great apes fine tuned it even more, and you see a lion out there on the clearing and the you know beyond the clearing of the savanna, and instead of like waiting like a gazelle until the lion starts running at you to move away, apes and great apes are like, okay, I'm gonna move on down this way and just get a little bit out of the way so I don't have to flee in complete panic, um, so getting scared, anticipation, anxiety, thinking about the next winter. Well, maybe I'll prepare some provisions. Maybe I'll build a hut. Let's find a cave. I'm going to invent fire to keep me warm during that winter. All these things were essentially caused by the anticipation of possible danger coming up around the bend. So anxiety was really good for us. And panic, I eventually learned, is also okay for us. Dwayne. Kev. These days... I'm just going to test you right now. Okay. What's my go-to snack? What do you always see me munching on? Wonderful pistachios. <laughs> very, very good. Thanks. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, just for someone like me who's always on the go and always working, I just like a handful of protein to be able to throw in my mouth. But by the way, they're also super delicious. But did you know that um, besides being delicious, they're one of the highest protein nuts? Each one ounce serving has six grams of protein, giving you over 10% of your daily value. How about that? Wow. I did not know that. You did not know that. Yeah. But also, I, I just, I mean, they're delicious, and uh, I can see them growing in popularity now because more people I know are having them. And what I, I like that wonderful pistachios did is they 
now sell a box that has little individual packets in there. Ooh. So, yes. So, Dwayne, you know what? Actually, write this note down. You know what we need at AfterBuzz okay. over at our network? Sure. You know, we have the good, nice coffee selection. Mm -hmm. We've got a popcorn. Okay. You know, we need to add. Pistachios. Yes. No. No? Wonderful pistachios. Wonderful pistachios. No, I mean it. Nice. I want to get, put that down. I want to get the handbags because I just think they're so good on the go. You know, especially, you know, during production, you need those hand, those little, uh, the Grammys. Yeah, when well, in craft service, you know most of the snacks are designed so you can hold them in your hand, eat it while you're working. But I feel like um, now that Wonderful Pistachios has these little snack bags, it's just perfect to uh, to keep in my bag. And when I'm going to work, or if I have to, uh, if I want to work out, throw a little bit, you know, in. But also, just it's delicious. And my the big my biggest time of munching on them is on these days. I'm traveling a lot, so on the plane rides, those six hour flights. Uh, east to west coast boom I take one of those bags of uh, wonderful pistachios and I'm JFF <laughs> I uh, am just just freaking fine I uh, I will say that's a new one Dwayne for me thank you Dwayne for me I am a um, I like the sea salt and vinegar I like the lightly salted and I like the regular Maria is partial to the chili anyway head over to wonderfulpistachios.com uh to get a bag of pistachios yourself and uh, you will not be sorry. So your brain is wired for you to have a thousand false alarms. So long as you don't have yeah, one missed chapter, alarm. I know in chapter four you go into the, I was wanted to get into the false alarms, but so let's go into it now. Go ahead. Exactly. So, and, and Randy Nessie, who is sort of the father of evolutionary psychiatry was like, Matt, you're actually normal. Panic is normal. Your brain is just trying to save you from getting eaten by a lion. It doesn't care that you've just had a slightly miserable experience and burned 50 calories running around, you know, sweating and hyperventilating and doing all that. It cares that you're alive. So it just wants you not to make the biggest mistake, which is getting eaten by a lion. So panic is actually just yeah, part of and, and, and Matt, of let me add evolution. to this for the panic attacks you described is when I think of in college, your thesis, that that's the culmination of your four year or six year college experience, eight year college experience. So in that time in your brain, everything is on the line. And as someone who's in this business True. and has Maria who does what you do for work, 100% the Kobe Bryant um, mishap is, would be every reason to panic and have anxiety because when you lose our our careers are very precious here. You lose them. It's like, it's, it, it's, it's so hard to win the lottery, even to get the career, the career you yeah. have, the career Maria has, and then to lose it. So to me, I get the logic. So like I, you're the psychologist, I'm with them. Like it was a reason to panic. You know, maybe not, a, maybe there's gotta be ways to not be as extreme, but by the way, I get it. I started having anxiety as you were telling me the Kobe story because we've been there. No, no, honestly, Matt, we've been there. And it's literally and we had an Oscar thing where someone mm -hmm. came up from behind, behind her on a live shot. There's Maria. Okay. And a lame producer not saying in the earpiece, I think it was America Ferrara's right behind her to say. So poor America Ferrara standing there. Like, um, hello, oh, does no. anyone know? I'm, exactly. I'm yelling at the screen. Maria, turn around. Turn around. Yeah, I'm at home. Like, and when I say America Friday didn't know any better, she buried Maria, thinking it was Maria. Like, it was just like, huh, what? Like, but it wasn't Maria. Was just, so, again, not as extreme as your situation, but we get it. I, I, I get why you would get into that place. So I think it's really good for people to understand that, you know, you're not crazy. There's not there's right. something wrong with you. Like those things you mentioned to me, I get why you would be in that situation. So yeah. continue from there. So with the thousand faces. Yeah. Um, it, it's just that, that concept of uh, knowing. Thousand for false me, alarms. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm really upset. The concept, <laughs> you, got, you got me all fired up. Thousand faces looking at Maria. And that, I mean, that's terrible. Oh my terrible. God. That's, yeah. 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 But not like yours, but that. still was bad and she didn't deserve it. And um, anyway, but, Okay, can carry on. The thousand false alarms. <laughs> Sorry. Just knowing that I wasn't broken and that, you know, panic is normal and it's not actually a kink in the human genome. And in some ways it's a feature. 
It uh, is, and let me add this too about the but we talked about evolution. So the ape needed to worry about the lion, and then the cavemen need to be worried about the heat and cold. But now look at our worries because the world has changed. How much more complex it is. So of course, now this is being built into us. But, exactly, and yeah. and I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head just there, which is, you know, the cave human needed to manage what like 20 30 relationships right <laughs> they didn't ever have to speak publicly uh <laughs> it was it was zog the chief or the head man who spoke and they all followed um but now we're managing thousands of relationships and online, social media in person, right social Ooh, media it's killing this young generation um, oh it's killing it's them terrible yes yeah, terrible and so it's much, much harder for us to navigate that social space and the performative space that is simply unnatural for human beings to do. We're not necessarily engineered to all be able to go in front of a Zoom and speak to a thousand people in our company about whatever it is we're working on. Um, you know, it's made it much, much harder. And yet, still, that kind of anxiety is normal. And just learning that it was normal and being like, told that I'm okay and not, you know, a total broken basket case was a huge relief for me. That concludes part one of our interview on anxiety and panic attacks with Matt Gutman, author of the book, No Time to Panic. Uh, in part two, we're going to be talking about Matt's holistic journey, ego death, uh, cognitive behavioral therapies, and then uh, steps that you can take if you are in the middle of a panic attack. So make sure you tune in. And then until then, what does it say here? How do we exit the show? Make good choices, be nice people, and stay present. This podcast and all related content published or distributed by or on behalf of Maria Menunos or MariaMenunos.com is for informational purposes only and may include information that is general in nature and that is not specific to you. Any information or opinions expressed or contained herein are not intended to serve as or replace medical advice, nor to diagnose, prescribe, or treat any disease, condition, illness, or injury, and you should consult the healthcare professional of your choice regarding all matters concerning your health, including before beginning any exercise, weight loss, or healthcare program. If you have or suspect you may have a healthcare emergency, please contact a qualified healthcare professional for treatment. Any information or opinions provided by a guest expert or host featured within website or on company's podcast are their own, not those of Maria Menounos or the company. Accordingly, Maria Menounos and the company cannot be responsible for any results or consequences or actions you may take based on information or opinions.